Well, good morning, everyone. We come to a very important chapter here in Jeremiah today. And uh, because of its importance, we're going to take it in chunks. We're just not going to do the whole chapter. And uh, this, this first uh, study of chapter 31 is going to be about the new covenant, which is one of the promises that the Lord makes through his prophet Jeremiah to the people who are in exile or going into exile and the fulfillment of that new covenant that uh, comes really in three stages with the coming of Christ, uh, the, the living out of the Christian life, and then eventually the return of Christ. So we'll see that in just a few minutes, but let's pray first. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this time that we might come to your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit would open our eyes to it, uh, that we might understand it and know the hope, the sure and certain hope, uh, that you have provided for us in Christ Jesus. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. So commentators often refer to this little section, really chapters 30, 31, 32, and 33, as, as um, uh, the hopeful section, the section of consolation, uh, because so much of Jeremiah is judgment uh, upon the people for their disobedience. But here we get this glimmer of hope. Now, it is hope in the future, and it is hope that happens certainly after the, the exile is over, after those 70 years of captivity, uh, and then eventually, as I said earlier, that is fulfilled in the coming uh, of Christ and will be fulfilled in total in his return. And as we look at this section, we can see chapter 31 uh, clearly, if in your Bible, uh, I would expect, uh, is laid out differently. Uh, than other chapters, and that gives us an indication that this is more poetry uh, than it is prose. And in fact, uh, the second half of chapter 30 through 31 uh, really is uh, a section that is characterized mostly by its poetic nature, and then in 32 it goes back to narrative uh, or, or prose, what we call it, so as it has been previously throughout the book of Jeremiah. So earlier chapters that we looked at uh, talked mostly about judgment. Every once in a while there was this glimpse of restoration, uh, but here in chapter 31 and in this section as a whole, 30 through 33, we see a a real focus on the eventual restoration of God's people. Um, and, and I'm just going to pick a, a little bit out of these chapters to read. Um, look, if we go backwards to chapter 30, verse 3, for behold, days are coming. And, and that is kind of a generic term. Uh, we jokingly say, uh, when will Christ return soon? Uh, is the answer and so the days are coming it's an unspecified date but it is sometime in the future for behold days are coming declares the Lord when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah says the Lord and I will bring them back to the land that I gave to their fathers and they shall take possession of it so those days are coming an unspecified time in the future the Lord promises to renew his covenant relationship with his people, telling them in, in that day, you'll be my people, I'll be your God. Uh, chapter 30, verse 22, and you shall, shall be my people and I will be your, your God, declares the Lord. So when we get to chapter 31, we're looking at one, if, if not the most significant prophecy that is listed in the Old Testament. Now, of course, there's Isaiah 53, which talks about the suffering servant, one of uh, several instances of that. But here, when we, we get to chapter 31, we're talking about the promise of the new covenant and the fulfillment of that and, and what all that means in our lives. So Jeremiah begins chapter 31. He's describing some uh, imagery about the captivity and, and wandering of his people. He celebrates the restoration of Israel to the return of her homeland. Uh, Jeremiah uses um, in, in, in verse 15 the image of uh, Rachel weeping. Now we've seen this previously um, on, on Sunday mornings when we looked at uh, the um, 
the birth narrative in Matthew, Matthew chapter 2 in particular, when it talks about Rachel weeping for her children. Uh, and if you remember that, it was, uh, it dealt with a place called Ramah, and Ramah is right there on the border between Israel and Judah, and it was the staging city uh, for the Babylonians, the Assyrians then the Babylonians, taking Israel and Judah into captivity. Uh, so the loss of both uh, of, of the children of both the northern and southern kingdom uh, were a, a cause for the figurative Rachel's weeping. Uh, Rachel was considered the mother of both uh, the northern and the southern kingdoms. Uh, so we see a little bit of that uh, here in verse 15. Thus says the Lord of voices heard in Ramah, lamentation, bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Uh, they've been taken into exile, uh, but yet we get this glimmer of hope that there will be a day when they will be returned. The promise restoration will mean an end to Rachel's weeping. Verse 16, keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for there is a reward for your work, declares the Lord. They shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is a hope for your future, declares the Lord, and your children shall come back to their own country. So Jeremiah is, is speaking of that, and really some of that is taken from chapter 1. Uh, some of those same phrases and words are used in chapter 1, verse 10, that are used there in um, 16 and 17 in particular. Now, we have to understand one of the most, uh, the most fundamental teaching uh, that these prophets at this time had, uh, had to proclaim and the prophecy that they gave to the people was because of their disobedience, uh, wanton purposeful, habitual disobedience to what the Lord's uh, law says. Now, the history of Israel, really from the time of Moses on, is almost a continual example of disobedience and apostasy. Um, it, you would think that the people who saw these great miraculous things that the Lord did to, to remove them from the bondage of Egypt, uh, take them through the desert, um, that would have sealed in their hearts the, the power and the, the awesomeness of God and his love for them. But it did not. Uh, they regularly fell short of what God expected from them. They were regularly disobedient. They were whiners and complainers. And God was faithful through that again and again and again. Um, but it just shows us the incapability of man to keep the law because the law is um, the demand of the law is perfection, uh, and man can never attain perfection in obedience. Um, and now we have God's promise of restoration, uh, even though he's talking to people who have been disobedient for generations. And particularly here in, in Judah and the promised restoration of both Israel and Judah, the northern and southern kingdoms and under one nation, um, we're dealing with people who, who were idolatrous, who carved idols out of stone and out of wood, who, who sacrificed their children to these gods, um, who, who actually took some of these and put them in the temple and, and worshiped them along with the one true God. And, and God is punishing them through their exile, but he says, I will restore you. And he's really is talking to the a faithful generation. He's talking about a faithful generation. Now Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, hinted at this promise, the new covenant, uh, many times, chapters really 42 and all the way through uh, the early uh, 60s, early uh, chapter 61. So Jeremiah is now giving us kind of the, the nature of this covenant. Uh, if you have your Bible and want to turn to chapter 31, verses 31 and following, uh, let me read a little bit for you here. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. But my covenant they broke. Okay, it's 
God is faithful in all of this. It is we who are unfaithful. Though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Now, that's an image that is seen in many places in the Old Testament, that God was the husband of his covenant people in the Old Testament. They were his wife. Um, Hosea is the, the perfect example of that illustration. And then it carries over to some degree to the New Testament as we are the bride and Christ is the groom. So chapter 31, verse 33 for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, again that phrase, sometime in the future, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. So Jeremiah is placing the start of this new covenant at an unspecified time in the future. And it is certain, but that it, it is certain to happen, but that time will not happen until after the completion of their time in exile, those 70 years counted from uh, 608 uh, BC onward. But the concept of the new covenant, is found in other places, Ezekiel, Isaiah, as I said. And we see that it is a real need for this new covenant because the people are continually breaking the old, not able to keep the law. Uh, and, and it will be a new covenant, a new covenant that supersedes uh, and in, in a sense is the fulfillment. Remember what Jesus said, I'm not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill the law and the prophets. And this is one of those things that the new covenant does. It fulfills it uh, because the old was um, the, never really meant. Uh, the, the keeping of the, uh, the law of the Lord could not be done perfectly. So there was the sacrificial system. That was a system that was temporary and had to be repeated again and again and again. And then along comes the perfect, sinless, spotless lamb, Jesus the Christ, who gives his life for us and his blood is shed to atone for our sin. There is no need for another sacrifice. That is the perfect sacrifice moving forward. So under the old covenant, the people had to be continually instructed to remember the law. So they were brought together. Remember, uh, the king actually was supposed to have a copy of the law with him at all times and to read from it each and every day. But we have very few references to any uh, of the kings of Judah ever reading the law. I think there are only three references uh, to that. But here in verse 34, we see the Lord declares that the law will be written not on tablets of stone, but upon the hearts of his people. It will no longer be necessary to teach it to one another because we will know it. You can compare Romans. The early chapters of Romans talks about this, that people are without excuse. They are without excuse because the, uh, the clear evidence of the existence of God the clear evidence of his law is written on our hearts. Um, and we can deal with the issue of conscience at a later time, but the conscience uh, that is informed by scripture desires to obey the word of God and to follow that. But there is a conscience within every man and woman, um, even as hard as we try to wipe that conscience from our thoughts, it is there and it tells us uh, what is wrong, especially when we are, are pursuing wrong purposefully. Uh, our conscience are tweaked. We may not understand it, but it is there within us. It is part of who we are as individuals. So the Lord says, I will forgive their iniquity and I will rem remember their sin no more. So, as I said, under the old covenant, provisions were made. There were sacrifices for a variety of things. But under the new covenant, he says, I will remember their sins no more. And I may add, as we find in other places, uh, those sins are as far as the east is from the west. Um, so not only will God remember them no more, he will forgive our sins. 
He will not hold them against us. So how is this new covenant and, and the things that Jeremiah is pointing to, how is that fulfilled in the New Testament? So we're going to take a, a quick look at some of those things. Um, there are at least three New Testament authors writing about this fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy in the New Covenant. Um, seven times in Luke and Paul and, the, and, and in Hebrews, we see this type of reference, the New Covenant of my blood. Paul refers to that, what, what Christ has said relative to the cup. Um, Paul also speaks of himself uh, in the company as ministers of the New Covenant uh, because they proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, under the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, remember the difference between Peter um, prior to the coming of the Holy Spirit upon him uh, and then afterwards in Acts, in the early chapters of Acts. Um, so in, in several ways, the writer of Hebrews pointed to the superiority of the Christian faith uh, over the things of the Old Testament. Christ is superior to angels. He's superior to uh, Moses, he's superior to all of those things because he is the perfect one. He is So in one way or another, these New Testament passages are indicating this new covenant that God promised and it was foretold in Jeremiah. So we have to remember, though, that, that the prophecy that comes out of Jeremiah has to be understood in the context of of that nation, but also in the context of the greater teachings of all scripture. And that's one of the things that prophecy has to be understood in its immediate context, in the context of the Old Testament culture, and also the context of all of scripture. So Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises about the restoration of the people of the covenant. These fulfillments that, that we see um, take place in a way that the Old Testament prophets really didn't expect to take place. They, they didn't have full knowledge. They were given what the Lord gave, said what the Lord said to say, uh, but they were not given the full answer as to how all those things would come to fulfillment. So the expectations uh, are, are, are there and the fulfillment comes, but the fulfillment comes over a longer period of time. It's not just a one-time instance where, oh, this is the day that those are all fulfilled. It comes over in a threefold manner, as I mentioned before, um, like the kingdom and, and the, the parable of the mustard seed. Uh, it starts small and it begins to grow in a very large fashion. So it comes first in the coming of Christ, that's the first stage, then it is continued through the, the living out of the body of Christ in this world, and then it is fulfilled, it's consummated in the return of Christ. So that comes over a long period of time, obviously more than 2,000 years, uh, and even though Christ is going to come soon, but soon may be another 2,000 years. So when we look at Jeremiah 31 and, and the promise of the new covenant regarding the restoration after exile, it's not just the 70 years are over and they return and now things are going to be great. It's the perfect fulfillment of that that is found in Jesus Christ. That the Lord is calling his people, writing upon their hearts, his law, and that comes with the coming of Christ. Now, in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant was broken on a regular basis, uh, and there was punishment for that. Uh, the, probably the most famous one is uh, the man who collects firewood on the Sabbath and is stoned because of that, uh, because he broke the law, he broke the covenant with God. Now, the New Covenant cannot be broken by those who belong to the Lord. We certainly can be disobedient. I don't want you to think that. But what we're talking about is if you are a member within the new covenant, then you cannot lose your salvation. Are there days you are disobedient? Yes. Are there days you are lax in your devotion? Yes. 
Are there days, weeks, months where you uh, question, where you think you may wander? Yes, but if you are a true believer, you are saved for all eternity. Um, but there will be a time when Christ returns when it will be a, there will be a clear distinction between the sheep and the goats, as Jesus says uh, in Matthew. So uh, up until that day, uh, as in the parable of the wheat and tares, there will be those within the church, that is the visible church on Sunday mornings and, and other times, people who profess faith in Jesus Christ, who will break the new covenant by their disobedience. And they will continue to do so, um, even though they think that they are part of the body of Christ. They give evidence in their some of their behavior, some of the words that they say. Um, but it's clear that at the return of Christ, there will be judgment. And not all who said, Lord, Lord, will belong to him. Not all who did these miraculous signs will give, Christ will say, you did not belong to me. I don't know you. Depart from me. So that is, in a sense, that the new covenant can't be broken by those who are Christ's. There is plenty of disobedience in the life of believers, but we see very clearly that there will be judgment and there will be wheat and there will be tares and there will be sheep and the goats and, and they will be within the church. And it's not our business to determine who is in and who is out. It is our job to encourage each one to greater holiness, to greater faithfulness, to examine our own lives relative to the question, are you within Christ or are you out of Christ? And there are certain markers that give evidence to that, but in reality, only Christ knows. And it is our job to, from Scripture, garner that which gives us assurance by our desire and longing for the things of Christ to get garner assurance from those things um, and even in the you know when you look at scripture it can be hard some days uh, and, and really raise questions in our minds am I in Christ uh, the bar seems pretty high for a life of, of holiness a life lived unto him am I there and we each need to examine our lives in light of scripture not how i feel about my relationship with the lord but what does scripture say a real believer looks like this is the new covenant that is sealed in the blood of christ and if you belong to him you can never be taken from his hand that is the assurance in the old covenant there are many questions many doubts many opportunities to be cast out but here, if you are in Christ, in the new covenant, if you belong to him, the promise is, I will remember your sins no more. They will be as far as the east is from the west, and I will be your God. So that gives us an introduction into chapter 31 and the concept of this new covenant that Jeremiah is prophesying about. And we'll see you next week as we dig into the particulars of chapter 31.